Hello, everybody, and welcome to a screencast presentation of uh, a lesson on the introduction to Judaism. We're going to be taking a look at some of the stories from Hebrew scripture that help to serve as the foundation of, of modern-day Judaism. Uh, some of the stories we're going to be familiar with, and we've already talked about a little bit in class, and some of the stories uh, are going to be new to us. And so let us begin. First, before we get started, let me just remind you that you should be taking good notes uh, on pen, using pen and paper uh, as we will be having a quiz on this information and you can use your notes if you take good ones. So don't shortchange yourself. Make sure that you take very good notes. If ever we go too fast during this presentation, feel free to pause the video and go back. That's the beauty of a screencast is you can watch it as many times as you need. So let's begin. The Hebrew scriptures begin with a period known as prehistory. In prehistory, the events are, record, are found before recorded history, meaning we're not quite sure what year these events were supposed to have occurred. These in include some stories that we've already taken a look at, including the stories of creation, the fall with Adam and Eve, and the story of Noah. But the real history of the Israelite people begins with the person of Abraham. Abraham serves as what's known as a patriarch or a father of the faith, along with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. So we're going to take a little bit of a look at who is Abraham, who is Isaac, and who is Jacob. Why are they so foundational in the formation of the Jewish faith? First, we'll start with Abraham. We've talked a little bit about Abraham in class. Abraham wasn't born Abraham, he was born Abram, a nomadic herdsman married to a woman named Sarai, who grew very old without ever having children. He is called upon by God and given a new name, Abraham, and his wife is given a new name, Sarah. An agreement, a solemn vow between God and Abraham is formed, known as a covenant. We've spent a lot of time in class talking about covenants. God promises Abraham descendants, which seemed very unlikely at Abraham's old age, and promises him the land of Canaan in exchange for Abraham's fidelity. He must remain faithful to his God in a time where polytheism was the predominant ideal of the day. You didn't bow down to just one God, and yet that is exactly what Abraham was expected to do. God made good on his promise, and Abraham had a son. His son's name was Isaac, which means laugh, because Sarah laughed at the even idea that she could have a child at her old age, and yet it was true. Isaac married a woman named Rebekah, and they had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the oldest. But Jacob came out right behind him, even holding on to his heel. Now Jacob, from an early age, always had this understanding that he was the one with the true birthright. He was meant to be the next patriarch, not his older brother Esau. And his mother, Rebekah, felt the same way. So in the painting that you see here, this is the story of how Rebekah and Jacob tricked Isaac, who in his old age couldn't see very well, into blessing Jacob and giving him the birthright, as opposed to the older son who was supposed to have it, Esau. This is one of the many instances we're going to see in Scripture where God chooses the unlikely choice. General understanding was that the oldest son became the heir, and yet God had chosen Jacob for this job. We're going to see this theme come up several times throughout this presentation. There are many stories, interesting stories, that surround Jacob. But one of the most interesting is a story in which Jacob wrestles an angel all night, never gives up, fight. At the end of the night, the angel gives Jacob a new name, the name of Israel. This is why the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are known as the Israelites, the followers of the patriarchs. Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter. 
These would become the 12 tribes of Israel. When the Israelites grew in number, they couldn't all be unified anymore. And so they divided into 12 tribes, each named after a son of Jacob. He, Jacob had tw- 10 of his sons with his wife Leah. Leah was his first wife, but it, he never intended to marry her. He wanted to marry her little sister, Rachel. Now back then, uh, polygamy, or marrying more than one wife, was allowed and, and was normal. And so after marrying Leah, Jacob pursued Rachel and married her as well. Now God felt bad for Leah, as the story goes, and so blessed her with many sons. Rachel, having Jacob's love, only had two sons, but her oldest son, Joseph, would be the favored son of Jacob. And Jacob is going to play another major role in the history of the Israelites. Joseph, because of his ability to interpret dreams, is going to have a major role in where the Israelites go. Now, Joseph's jealous brothers all jealous because Jacob preferred him, even though they were older, uh, sold him off to slavery in Egypt. But while in Egypt, Joseph was able to interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh that predicted that there would be a great famine. And so because of that, Egypt was able to prepare. They stored up food and water and supplies so that when the famine came, they would have enough. Now, Canaan wasn't as lucky. They were really feeling the effects of the famine. And so when they went to go get food from neighboring Egypt, they found Joseph there, and Joseph welcomed them back. And the Israelites moved to Egypt as welcome guests. Here is where we're going to see the end of the book of Genesis. All of these stories of the patriarchs all make up, and the stories of prehistory, all make up the book of Genesis. But now we're going to be moving on to the book of Exodus, which is going to tell us a little bit more about what happens to the Israelites generations later in Egypt. As many of you know, the Israelites are not just welcome guests in Egypt, but later become enslaved there. And so here uh, is where we find the story of Moses, generations later called to bring his people out of Egypt and out of slavery. Moses' mission begins with a great theophany. You remember in class we talked about this idea of theophany, epiphany as a major realization, theophany as a realization of God. Moses encounters God in the burning bush, a bush that's burned up in flames but is not consumed by them. And in his conversation with God here, in his experience of God here, a couple of important things happen. First is that God's name is revealed. This name is represented by the letters Y-H-W-H. Sometimes it is sounded out and pronounced Yahweh. But in the Jewish tradition, this name is considered so sacred that it is not said aloud at all. The name means I am who is, or I am who am, I am the one that exists. And it speaks to God's transcendence, God's eternity. The fact that God has always been. He's not just the God of the Israelites, he's the God of all people and all time. And so this name reveals a lot about who God is. God calls on Moses to tell the Pharaoh to free his people so that they might worship him again. In order to do that, he helps Moses out by bringing down a plague, a new plague on the Egyptian people each time the Pharaoh refuses to free the Israelites. Now a plague is going to be some kind of disease or some kind of uh, natural event uh, that makes life very difficult for the Egyptian people. So let's just take a quick look at what kind of plagues we're talking about. First, Moses turned the water into blood. Next, Egypt was overrun with frogs and gnats and flies. Then a disease struck down all of the livestock 
and the people were covered with boils and sores. Hail rained down. And locusts came down and ate all of the crops. And for days, Egypt was covered in darkness. Yet despite this, the Pharaoh would not be moved. So here we have the most famous story to come out of Exodus, perhaps, or one of them at least, the story of the Passover. After the ninth plague, the Pharaoh still refused to set the Israelites free. And so the tenth plague would be the most serious. It would be the death of the firstborn son of every household. To protect themselves from the plague, Moses instructed the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb and spread its blood on the doorposts so that the plague would pass over the houses of the Israelites, only killing the, the firstborn of the Egyptians. This is where we get the term Passover. One of the important, most important celebrations in Judaism, even to today, because of what it allowed for the Israelites, which I'm going to continue on in the next video as I'm running out of time here. Uh, so please uh, finish up your notes and continue on to the next link. Thank you.